Hello again, um, it's Paul Beckwith, and I'm going to continue to talk about um, this uh, very, very important paper, um, which I highly recommend that you uh, just Google the name, you know, look up the paper, look at the plots and data yourself, and it should make a lot more sense to you after I've explained, uh, finished explaining it in this video. So in the last video, we left off with... Um, Oh, and the paper, by the way, is uh, it's called Arctic Sea Ice in a 1.5 degree Celsius warmer world. Okay, so in this figure, it shows the surface air temperature anomaly with respect to the, a reference period on this axis. Um, and it looks like it's about, uh, you know, the zero here is here. So it's about the 1950s or 60s it was zeroed, so relative to that period. I guess it says 1961 to 90 for the Hadley and 1950 to 1989 for just temp. Okay, so those reference lines and then the right axis is anomalies relative to, so what they did, and rather than using 1850 or 1750 or 1880 to 1910 as a pre-industrial uh, situation, they looked at it, they took a 2000 year long pre-industrial control simulation and that's the uh, period, that's the, and, and they call that pre-industrial, which is an interesting way of doing it. And what you can see here is, and, and this is the RCP 2.6 is the blue um, mod, so that scenario, and this is a higher emission scenario, RCP 4.5. Right now we're much higher than both of these, um, the, but these, these are the representative concentration pathways that they used. Okay, and uh, this is the sort of curve that you get. Okay, um, and they used um, basically they used the they simulated using the Max Planck Institute Earth System Model ESM, a hundred member strong ensemble of simulations. They sim they covered the time period 1850 to 2100, and they looked at RCP 2.6 and 4.5. To get and they got the internal variability, so basically they uh, these anomalies were relative to what to pre-industrial and they called they defined pre-industrial by the mean global temperature of a 2,000 long pre-industrial simulation, and that temperature is 13.7 degrees Celsius. So they use 13.7. Uh, they use the temperature now and through this time period that the graph shows and they subtracted the 13.7 which they used as the pre-industrial temperature. So that's a very interesting way of doing it and uh, they had uh, basically they, the, two, the two sets of data, the Hadley, the estimated temperature anomaly relative to pre-industrial levels for the Hadley data was 0 0.39, they needed to add 0 0.39 on and 0.36 on for the gist temp to have you down to the baseline of the 2000 year period. Okay, so the results. Now here is the key results. Now this is very, very key. Jan for each of the months here, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, they plotted all of the data. The blue again is, is the RCP 2.6. The red is RCP 4.5. This is the observations, the data, and they fit a line to it. And that gave them a sensitivity in terms of um, millions of square kilometers of sea ice loss per degree Celsius temperature rise. And they, so September is minus 4.1. Um, and Using that number and what the sea ice is now, they said it's going to be ice free at 1.7 degrees Celsius above pre industrial. So September is the will be the first to go. Now, the higher sensitivity is with August actually, but there's more ice in August than in September, so September still reaches zero first, um, but it's ice free at 1.7. So at 1.7, you basically have ice free in August and September. And then if you look at these temperatures, this is ice free at 2.2 in July, minus 4.3 sensitivity, which is again higher than the September number. Um, and you have to look at uh, October. Okay, uh, if you look at October, it's 2.3. Um, it was a sensitivity of minus 3.6. So 
When we lose ice in September, we're going to lose it in August, okay? And then we next lose it in July, it looks like, okay? So we lose ice in September, August, and July, and then we lose ice in October, okay? So it gives the order of each month in which it's lost, and it's a little bit different from the um, Wipnius uh, graphs, which would indicate something slightly different in terms of the order. It shows September going, and then August, and then October, and then July, and then November, etc. It swings back and forth. So it's not quite like this according to this. So these are the first three months to go. September, August, July, then October goes. And then, uh, you know, if you compare the November number to the June number, the June number, it goes first lower temperature here and then it goes in November and then it goes in May okay you see what I'm doing May is next the next lowest number and then December is 5.4 next lowest number and then it goes in April 6.6 uh, .6, and these are high these are conservative numbers and then the last uh, bastion of ice in the Arctic January disappears and then February disappears, and then March disappears. So this is the holdout. So January, February, March goes. Okay, so that's the gist of the data. So this is very, very crucial data. Now, of course, so the relative, what I'm arguing is that the relative numbers are important. Those are probably likely to hold, but the absolute numbers of temperature, you know, I suspect that when we start losing ice in all of September and all of August, you know, I said in the introduction to the last video that um, at two degrees Celsius, we lose ice in August and September. And in, at 2.5, we lose ice in July, August, September, and October. Okay, and I suspect that the feedback from that kick in and they draw, they pull down the ice in the other months much faster. And that's why I still hold that, you know, I think we're going to go to a completely ice-free Arctic Ocean for all months. Okay, and no ice is defined as that one million square kilometers. Okay, so, so simply by the slopes of the, the regression, and if you assume the slopes are the same, it's tracking linearly for each month at the moment, but you know, I suspect that that can accelerate and pick up um, as months start dropping, as months become ice-free and the duration increases more and more. Okay, so that's a key plot. Um, and, uh, you know, the uncertainty on this, 95% likelihood for the high sensitivity observational estimate of September Arctic sea ice, right, um, dropping to zero. Okay, so 1.7 degrees C global warming, September, 95% confidence inter interval that between 1.5 Celsius and 1.9. So 1.7 plus or minus 0.2, giving you this range, and then September Arctic sea ice vanishes. Now the low sensitivity observational estimates have a number of 2.3 instead of 1.7. 2.3 plus or minus, I guess, about 0.2. Okay, um, and these values are a conservative estimate of the global warming at which the Arctic Ocean loses its sea ice during summer for the first time because we consider only monthly means, right? It's the mean for the whole month, but from the beginning of the month to the end of the month, there can be huge changes, huge melt loss, huge melt out of the Arctic sea ice. So that's why these numbers are also very conservative. A couple previous studies, Rosenblum and Eisenman in 2016, said the global warming above 1.1 degrees Celsius relative to the period 1980 to 1999. So this would be a global warming of 1.8 C relative to pre-industrial for the ice to disappear in September. So that agrees well with this num these numbers of 1.7 plus or minus 0.2. And another paper, Screen and Williamson, said that at 2 degrees might be insufficient to prevent an ice-free Arctic. And meanwhile, March, um, March has a, uh, you know, would need much higher temperatures to... So the Arctic Ocean would become ice-free all year round for a warming of, of 9 plus or minus 1.5 C. And, you know, in reality, it's much lower than this because the thinning of the winter sea ice cover, the, you know, the linear relationship between winter sea ice coverage and global warming breaks down for higher amounts of global warming. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, so let's have a look. Now, this is another key 
point key figure in this paper. So this is a graph. Here it shows estimated sea ice area in millions of square kilometers up here and for each month here and the amount of warming. Now the observations from 20, 2007 to 2016 are the, do, are, are the open circles here. And you can see that they align with the, with the 1.0 degree Celsius of warming. Okay, so that's consistent. Now with uh, two degrees of warming, notice that the, the, the purple lines here, they drop to zero basically in August and September. So two degrees Celsius of global average warming, global mean temperature rise, August and September lose all of, their, all of the Arctic sea ice. And at 2.5 degrees Celsius, then July, August, September, October are pegged to zero. And this is the 1 million square kilometer, essentially virtually free Arctic. Now remember that most scientific studies or most scientists are saying the only ice left is gonna be the ice that's ridged around the Canadian archipelago and other coastlines. And I say, nope, that's wrong. It's gonna be circling the, Ar the North Pole. And I've explained that in previous videos. That, so when it's under one, that one, I think, will be circling the North Pole. Um, and this shows you the relative change of the sea ice area in percentage relative to the period 1953 to 1978. So 100% ice loss, July, August, September, October for 2.5 degrees warming and just uh, gone totally for August and September for 2 degrees Celsius warming. Okay, so that's another key plot. And in March, you know, you can look at March. So basically with these levels of warming, with 2 degrees and 2.5 degrees of warming, if we look at March, we've lost about 80% of the sea ice. And you can look for each month and you can see what percentage is gone each month. So, so this, combined, this, this graph combined with uh, this data is very, very key for determining what's going to happen to the Arctic sea ice after the first blue ocean event. So this is very, very clear data. I highly recommend that you have a look, a look and read, it, read this paper. It's well worth a lot of discussions. Okay, July and October. Uh, so there's a 15% chance of having a near ice-free Arctic Ocean for at least three consecutive months between July and October for two degrees Celsius if the high sensitivity estimate is accurate. And then in March, we're losing about 80, about 20% of the Arctic sea ice. Now, the spatial distribution of sea ice. So when we lose all this sea ice, where do we lose it? Well, this is the amount of warming. This is March, the peak of the ice. This is September, the minimum of the ice. At half a degree and at one degree, here we are, we lose the ice around the edges. With 1.5 degrees, the ice shrinks back into the center here. And notice this is kind of agrees. It's not the ridged ice that's left. It's the, just the ice in the center circling the North Pole right here. And then at two degrees and at 2.5, of course, there's ice in the winter in March, but there's no ice in, in September in the Arctic. And at two degrees Celsius, there's no ice in September, August and September, and at 2.5, there's no ice in July, August, September, or October, as I've explained. So this is a very key, uh, key figure indicating uh, the spatial distribution of the Arctic that will be, of the ice that will be left in the, in the Arctic. Okay, um, and what else did I want to say? Those are the key things. There's some summary items here. So um, there's uncertainty in the sea ice sensi Arctic sea ice sensitivity. That's the slope of the curve. And, uh, you know, uh, we lose more Arctic sea ice per degree of global warming in the summer, um, July, August, September, above four times 10 to the four million uh, square kilometers. And then in the winter, we lose less, about minus 1.6. And uh, Arctic will be nearly ice-free in September with a warming of 1.7 plus or minus 0.2. Two degrees uh, will, will no ice in August and September. Okay, so this is a key paper. Thank you for listening.